Millions of words have been written and spoken about it. Laws have been passed against it. Cults have sprung up around it. Individuals using it have experienced hope, suffering, tragedy. But for all the controversy, what is known today about LSD is fragmented, not altogether. In the next few minutes, we will be exploring these fragments, a complex mixture of superstition, medical research, personal experiences, a history that began yesterday. In 1951, a small provincial village in southern France named Saint-Esprit was stricken by a strange malady. Overnight, residents of all ages, hundreds of them, awakened to sharp pains, high fevers, mass insomnia, and incredible hallucinations. One man spent the hours of day and night endlessly counting the pains in his window. Another compulsively wrote the same words over and over. Small girls saw tigers in a room and blood dripping from the ceiling. All complained of severe burning sensations. More than 300 cases had been counted before the plague was identified as St. Anthony's fire, a poisoning produced by ergot, a fungus that grew on rye, which later was milled and baked bread. A direct relationship between St. Anthony's fire and LSD-25 has never been clearly established to this day. Ports from St. Esprit excited the attention of the young scientist who 15 years before had first synthesized LSD from ergot. On accidentally ingesting a tiny amount of the drug, the discoverer, Dr. Albert Hoffman, had experienced symptoms remarkably similar to those now occurring in the tiny village. I noted with dismay that my environment was undergoing progressive change. I had the greatest difficulty in expressing myself. My visual fields wavered. I was overcome by a fear that I was going crazy. That first LSD-induced psychosis set off a flurry of laboratory testing. We're studying the effects of hallucinogenic drugs, both LSD and mescaline, on behavior of rats. Now we're giving him the LSD. We're going to see its effects on his behavior. But our ultimate goal is our understanding of why they do certain things to human behavior. There seems to be an interaction between the effects of the drug and stress, which fits in what we know about the effects of hallucinogenic drugs in respect of good and bad trips. When you give a large dose of either mescaline or LSD, one of the things that you notice is it produces catatonic behavior. Like this animal had a large dose of LSD, and you can see how relaxed he is, and you swing him around. The difference between a rat without any hallucinogen. One of the main things, you put him in a very bizarre posture, and he just stays there, which is not true for a normal animal. See how he fights and struggles, this animal just stays there. They call this catatonia. Catatonia is often observed in schizophrenics as are hallucinations. As small amounts of LSD provoke similar reactions in normals, it began to be speculated that in certain individuals, their bodies were generating either this chemical or one much like it, and that the presence of it was creating schizophrenia. After several years of research, we have found out that there were definitely more differences than similarities between the LSD reaction and schizophrenia. Dr. Stanislav Graf, born and raised in Czechoslovakia, today heads up research at Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. Our present opinion about LSD is that LSD is something like an amplifier or catalyst which just manifests the unconscious processes in the brain. We began our LSD research in the early 1960s. And it began as a very unusual program, a program to research the influence of these unusual psychedelic drugs on normal people. How did these drugs influence the psyche, the unconscious? What did it tell us about the inner space of normal people? Dr. Jean Houston, with her husband, Dr. Robert Masters, directs New York City's Foundation for Mind Research. They were among the first to use LSD as a means of probing psychic depths. And in this simulated case, she shows how the drug worked as a tool for mental research. And of course, this research required a great deal of preparation and control. All of our subjects were first medically screened, then they were psychiatrically screened because we were dealing with what is termed normal. 
we discovered that there were seemed to be four major depth levels of the psyche, which emerged over the course of the eight or 10 or 14 hours of the LSD. LSD is very unusual in that under carefully controlled scientific research circumstances, it can tell us an enormous amount about the mind and about using the mind more creatively without drugs. LSD can also, under these black market or illegal circumstances, uh, make people extremely impressionable so that if they are in a circumstances which is negative or fearful, they may sustain that fear or that negativism for months or even years to come. This was a bad trip, right? How many times have you tripped altogether? About seven. About seven. How many of those times were bad trips? About five. So most of them were bad trips. New York City police now bring young people on bad trips to Bellevue Hospital, where Dr. William Frosch is associate medical director of the psychiatric division. Why do you do it again, then? You know, there was a concert in Central Park, and I was up there. Here's somebody who's had a previous good trip. He went into this trip thinking that this would also be a good one. There was music he wanted to listen to, the setting was Central Park, but somehow something went wrong. You upset about it? Well, I feel that at that time I needed it. He is still somewhat under the influence of the drug. His responses seem to be somewhat slow. I guess the acid just brought out everything, all the anxieties I had, all the emotions I had. The unfortunate thing is that we are not able often to predict in advance who will have a bad trip when. This is what we call a bad trip because it's, he has much more fear than he had before. And there's an interaction between the stress of the electric shock and the drug. When people have these bad trips, their disturbed behavior is very much closer to what's seen in schizophrenia. It's only the good trips which are very dissimilar from schizophrenia, that is primarily visual perceptual distortions rather than uh, paranoia and delusions, which you do get with bad trips. This young man has just taken street acid. It will take effect in approximately one hour. Even though this will not be a bad trip, experienced users question the goodness of any drug that turns one who takes part in life into a mere sightseer. I'm getting all kind of really nice things with the leaves. That's kind of melting together, you know. Melting together and then coming apart and vibrating. But it's all moving. That's what's incredible. How many trips have you had? I don't know, somewhere between 20 and 30, I guess. Any bummers? Yeah. I had a bummer in New York once. New York is a bummer. <laughs> well, yeah, New York's a bummer. But it was even more of a bummer because it was out on the streets of New York. You know, I was lost for a while. And that was the bad part, being lost in New York all by myself. The circumstances what made it bad. Being in the city, being alone, it was horrifying. It's terrifying. Oh, wow! I just followed them right home. There they are. There's the whole bunch of them. Mommy and Daddy and all the kids and the cousins and the relatives and everybody. Dinner. Just little things like wow. just, you know, a group of people hovered over, you know, an, an anthill. <laughs> just watching the ants scurry around. It, uh, it's kind of a going back into your childhood, too, I think. When you're stoned, you can get hung up and, like, stare at a piece of dirt for a day. When I was dropping acid, one time I was doing that, I was staring at a piece of dirt. And a little baby came up to me and was staring at this piece of dirt in the same way. And I realized that was really crazy. I mean, it was all right for a baby, but for a 20-year-old, it was crazy. I stopped dropping acid. I really got tired of just tripping around and grinning. Well, let me tell you about the first time I took acid. I had been uh, pretty confused and lost in my life at the time. I really didn't know what I wanted to do or who I was, really. I had ideas and I had feelings, but I really didn't have a clear picture of what I wanted out of life. And I had a friend from out of town who was into all the drugs at the time, and at that time, acid had just come out, and he gave me a sugar cube. And my reaction was, I don't want to take it, I'm afraid. And he reassured me that it would be all right, and um, I took it. You know, I figured, what the hell? It was a simple sign. I just figured, what the hell? I gotta find a new way of living. I gotta find a new way of life. 
Young people today are identified with music festivals. Young people in every age have had their own unique thing to identify with. But there are a large number of bad drug trips at these festivals. And so we have usually a separate tent set up, which we call the trip tent. When the person comes in with this type of problem, the only way you can make contact is physically, by hugging them, holding their hand, and trying to make them feel the presence of your body. And by holding a person, you give them a certain reality, the feeling of someone near them, someone who's helping them. We don't like to give any sort of drug to the people who are having a bad trip. This seems to lead to an increased frequency of flashbacks and it reinforces the concept of taking drugs to solve whatever problem there is. LSD is not manufactured by any company in the United States, nor is mescaline or the other hallucinogenics. And so the stuff that is available is of very poor quality. This is why we ask the kids who come into the tent what they took, how much of it, when they took it, and if they have a sample of it. This is street acid picked up at the music festival we've just seen. Most of these samples are probably not pure. Dr. Wolfgang Vogel is a biochemist. In his laboratory, he isolates and identifies chemicals in street acid. Chemicals we expect, chemicals that sometimes surprise us. These spots are caused by a minor tranquilizer. Uh, these down here are probably spots caused by strychnine. There is some feeling amongst heads that by taking LSD with strychnine in it, that they get a faster high and a better high. And sometimes it contains more strychnine than LSD. I don't know if they were tripping or not, but they were sure in a great mess from the strychnine. LSD was first considered a dangerous drug and made illegal in 1965. It's so easy to get acid. You can get it anywhere. Where there's a little chemistry lab, there's somebody making acid. The penalty for sale and possession is a felony, which makes the person liable to imprisonment or more than a year. You usually get it from a friend or people deal it. If you're paying more than like $2, you're getting burnt. <laughs> the handing of a dose of LSD from one individual to another is a delivery or a gift. And even that, that simple act, constitutes sale under the law. With these black market situations, catch as catch can, this bathtub gin LSD, it's one of the most dangerous things that has happened in the 20th century, uh, particularly for young people, because young people, their egos are not together. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not, they're not uh, together as a self. And what can happen is LSD can act as a degluing agent, rather like Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> and when they come out of the session, they're not apt to be put together in the same way. And they may have actually lost part of their basic psychological cohesiveness. The whole lifestyle is one of a fantasy world. Simple, very, very childlike. And there's just this happy fantasy, you know, smiling, almost moronic kind of existence. Like when I was living in Haight-Ashbury and everybody was taking acid, well, everybody thought they loved each other and they talked about it, but nobody was really close to anybody else. I feel like I'm, I have to do something, you know. And you don't really want to have to do anything, you know. You just want to just trip. Well, what I found was that you really do lose your ego. By the time I finished taking acid, I don't think I had any ego left. And I was really ready to kill myself because there was nothing left. <laughs> there was just no sense of myself left at all. And the kids who are taking acid, who talk about love and involvement, and oh, I love you, and I'm just loving life, and, and I love you, man, and I dig you, and it's so easy to sit and say, I love, but it's another thing to get up and do something that involves your life, your energy, your feelings. One of the things that happens with acid is one detail becomes very important. There was a stone wall that had moss on it. So when I painted it, I just covered it with green. And I did the same thing with as many colors out there that I could see. And the end result is that the painting is an extremely colorful painting and that it basically works. 
And when I look at it, it really makes me feel like I'm on acid. Many people claim LSD enhances creativity. They say an artist performs better under the influence of the drug. This is not necessarily so. I have never really run a controlled study concerning the effect of LSD on creativity, but I have given it to many artists. They usually didn't have too much success in the session because in spite of the fact that they had very interesting experiences, LSD at the same time seemed to impair their motor coordination and they were not able to express what they were seeing. This we saw, for example, in uh, the experiment uh, here with uh, a friend of mine from Prague, Paul Fierlinger. Well, after I took the drug, uh, uh, I believe it was orally. In the beginning, it was perfectly natural for me to draw. And uh, then after 20 or 30 minutes, the drug started taking uh, effect on me. And everybody was trying to encourage me to draw, look at me, what do you think I look like? Draw a picture of my face, how do you see me now? I tried to draw, so I picked it up, a uh, Flowmaster pencil, and, and suddenly it felt so thick as if I were holding a, a, a log in my hand. And with that, you just can't draw anything. So I threw it away and I gave up. So our usual experience was that the artists were not able to perform very well while they were under the influence of LSD. On the other hand, quite a few of the artists were able to remember what they have experienced in the session and use it as a source of inspiration for the canvases they painted after they had the experience. Frequently, persons taking LSD under controlled conditions reported a new ecstatic sense of unity with all of life. Religious symbols seemed to come from nowhere. It was found that LSD relieved some terminal cancer patients of pain, depression, and anxiety. With this discovery, it was decided to try LSD along with extensive psychotherapy and the treatment of alcoholics. For the past seven years, we've been treating persons who suffer from alcohol abuse here at the Topeka VA Hospital with the drug LSD-25. Dr. David Dean is assistant director of a federally approved LSD therapy program. Patients are physically and mentally screened before admission. LSD is administered twice over a 12 period. This is the second and largest dose for these patients. What you'll see here is real. The setting is extremely important. The more homelike or informal the setting, the greater opportunity the individual has of really discovering himself, of coming to know who he really is. I don't know what, how to explain this, but it, I actually saw it. It uh, actually scared me at first, was the body of me slowly dissolving. The skin, now all the meat would go completely from under my skin. I couldn't see any blood. Finally, only the skin was hanging on the bones. And I was lying as a skeleton, but completely conscious of my heart beating and uh, being in still like I had a mind. Just relax. We're here to take care of you. Don't fight. That was the earlier part of the experience. And then the later was this triumphant march that I had. Just feeling of being on this white charger was soared up in the air, you know, and the crowds were roaring. And, uh, I guess the music in the background, I wasn't even conscious of the music, but I could actually hear the crowd and uh, the noise of the triumphal march like uh, the Romans used to come back from battle. I don't know. <laughs> it gave me a big, uh, big feeling inside, you know. First thing that I could say about it was that uh, it was the first time that I ever really felt free to actually let myself go and just do the things that I wanted to do. And I did experience a time there where uh, it seemed as if, if all these people that I had been, or tried to be, were just leaving my body. Miss Perry, who was sitting beside me, I don't know if I was shaken or what, but she just put her hand on my arm. And it seemed like all the tension and everything in my body just went, flowed through my body, and went to the point where she touched my hand, and just went into her hand. Of the 1,200 individuals who have completed the treatment program now, somewhat over 50% have remained abstinent for at least two years or beyond. I certainly don't feel like now that I would want to drink. It seems trivial. <laughs> it just didn't seem necessary. We know what alcohol does to the body, the liver, the brain. 
we know that LSD helps to curb certain cases of alcohol abuse. But what else do we know about this admittedly powerful drug? Well, a great deal has been done with studies on LSD, and the result is probably we do not know what LSD does, how it produces its effects on the mind. We really do not know, does LSD really produce chromosomal damage? Chromosomes contain genes which pass on hereditary traits from parent to offspring. Does LSD really produce male formations? Does LSD have some effects on the body which we are not even aware of yet? We don't know. And I think this really is at the moment the risk and the biggest danger in using LSD. We are not able often to predict in advance whether or not an individual at a particular moment in their life is going to have a bad trip or a good trip. There is no fear, there is no paranoia so bad as a psychedelic paranoia. Because under usual ordinary paranoia or fear, you can get out and you can run like the Dickens. You have some place to go. But in a psychedelic paranoia, you are locked up in, under, in your own skin. You are frightened to the death of your own existence. Because this dream world that you're living in is real to you at that time. And I can't see these, these kids that take it out in the, the street or wherever they take it. I'd be afraid to be scared to death if I were to take it that way. LSD is like atomic energy. It has enormous potentiality for good or evil. And you don't really want to have to do anything. You, know? you just want to just trip. It really drains your energy. I was so loving on acid. But when I stopped taking acid, or when I was down, I wasn't loving anymore. The whole lifestyle is one of a fantasy world. It's very, very childlike. Almost like a, a moronic, smiling kind of existence. So we have something that's a Pandora's box. It has tremendous potential for good, if used wisely, like atomic energy. Or it can provide for a whole holocaust of mental Hiroshima's.